Hello everybody and welcome back to Military Aviation History. I'm your host Chris, you might know me as Bismarck and I have a whole bunch of questions here that were posted on my Inside the Cockpit episode on the Fokker D7. Came out a couple of uh, weeks ago and I'm going to be uh, answering those in this video. Now as always, Patreons and channel members will get priority on their questions and then I will go through the, the rest of the questions as time permits. Now, if you have a question on any of the aircraft that I have already covered in Inside the Cockpit, please post the questions in that very specific episode and then I can go through those uh, once I'm ready to make a Q&A on them and collect them and so on. Also, the same thing applies to the inside cockpits that are, for example, being released in the upcoming weeks. If you have a question, you know, if you watch that episode and you have a question on the episode, uh, just put it in the comment section of that video. Do not leave it in this video right here, because um, otherwise I have to look into many places and I will most likely miss the very specific question that you asked me. Always use the specific episode on the aircraft that you want to know more from. Now, let's get this started then. Uh, Lyndon Sharpton wants to know, how often did one need to pump the fuel pump when flying? Uh, you don't use the fuel pump or the air pump when flying uh, at all. Uh, that is actually uh, only used for the startup sequence of the engine. You wouldn't use it uh, otherwise, as far as I'm aware. Skywalker Wark. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Benzene and petrol are different things. Yes, uh, so I think this might be a language issue here because uh, benzene in itself sounds very close to, for example, the German word benzene, benzene. So the benzene, benzene. Uh, benzene is in Germany at least what other people would say fuel or petrol for a car. And it's also not benzol, which is actually benzene mixed with other aromatics as well. So those two things are, uh, are different. Uh, benzene itself is a uh, aromatic hydrocarbon that is uh, extracted from uh, crude oil and in certain ratios it can be added to uh, fuel mixtures and it gives different properties depending on the ratio of the uh, mixture. Although I guess that sometimes the word, the generic term petrol can be used to apply to a benzene or a benzene mixture, if that makes sense. Scotty Fox with the next question here. Uh, I'm noticing there's not a firewall between the pilot and the engine. Is my observation accurate? If you look at the scene of the Fokker D7 that I filmed in Munich, you will see there is this sort of metal plate division between the engine bay and the rest of the aircraft. So that in itself is a firewall in, in, uh, yeah, well, in, in practical purposes, really. The aircraft is, of course, not one that was built during World War I. There is a post-war uh, production. We'll get into that in uh, just a bit as well. But as far as I'm aware from the World War I Fokker D7s, the firewall was initially not something that was mounted, but it came in with the production one. So the very first Fokker D7s that were produced did not have that firewall and that was added later. As far as I'm aware, but these things are incredibly hard to track down. So I wouldn't bet my money on it uh, just, just yet. There was a very good comment by, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I think I'm going to mispronounce your name, Maki Pia Luta. Maki Pia Luta, who actually talked a little bit more about a specific object history that we have in the uh, Flugwerft Schleißheim in Munich in the museum. So uh, there's no way for me to currently check whether this is correct, but uh, as far as he's aware, the aircraft is actually a 1926 production in the Netherlands, uh, and it was written off in 1947, uh, sold off to Germany before the Second World War, and then post-war found in a barn and then ended up in the museum. Again, I can't verify this information at the moment. I will contact the museum once it is again permissible. Right now with Corona lockdown, it's a little bit hard to get in touch with them and this is not that pressing of a, of a question. So thanks very much for sending the information in. Appreciate it and uh, I'll, I'll uh, see if I can uh, have some more information from the museum as well. Michael wants to know, why does a video with such amazing and <laughs> completely unique material have so few views? Okay, I put this in here for fun. Here's the thing, whether there's a lot of views or not depends on the aircraft. Yeah, YouTube is a little bit strange in the fact that World War I stuff doesn't really work that well. Uh, and I'm not the only one to have made that observation when it comes to aviation. Um, I think the Great War Channel also once said it in one of their update videos that aviation in World War I, for some reason on YouTube, doesn't work really well. The views on my channel depend on this, depending on what aircraft we are covering in inside the, uh, inside the cockpit. However, if you do enjoy inside a cockpit, um, you know, 
If you see a new episode, click on it. You might discover some quite unique aircraft that you didn't know about yet. For example, I recently uploaded the Debotin D26, which is an interwar aircraft. It's an absolutely beautiful, pristine aircraft, still kept in flying condition. You should definitely check out that episode. It's probably something that you wouldn't click on immediately when you saw it, but um, trust me, it's worth it. So yeah, if you, uh, if you like the series inside the cockpit, also consider sharing it and that way it will uh, get more views. Share it wherever, friends, forums, the internet, wherever you, uh, you want to. Completely voluntary, of course, it's up to you. All right, Thomas, and uh, this actually was on the Armistice video that was released a couple of days after the initial Inside the Cockpit episode. Did the Allies get their hands on that aircraft after the war or not? So I'm presuming that you mean generally the uh, D7s rather than the specific aircraft that we had in that episode. And yes, the Allies did get their hands on quite a number of D7s, but not as many as they anticipated. First of all, they greatly underestimated, excuse me, they greatly overestimated the number of D7s on the front lines. Uh, the Germans burned some of them or flew them back. Uh, the pilots essentially took their, their belongings and flew back home and landed in some field and just abandoned the aircraft sometimes there or sometimes they hit them and so on. But then they were subsequently destroyed and if you leave an aircraft like that out for more than a couple of weeks it's, it's going to have quite a lot of issues just because you know, rain and weather effects on it. Uh, so it's yeah they're, they're going to be rotting away quite quickly. But a lot of them were uh, also handed over to the Allies and the Allies got their hands on them and then uh, treated them with varying degrees of care. And uh, yeah, another question will also be uh, hinting on this again. David wants to know, do you mean dished pistons? I would have thought that dome pistons would actually decrease cylinder volume. So this is a thing that I really explained really, really badly in the Inside the Cockpit episode. So in the specific scene where I talk about the changes that were made to the Mercedes uh, free engine, uh, I in, uh, talk about the introduction of dome pistons. So if you just think about the flat piston head, right, you'll essentially have a dome on top of that. That's a dome piston. And I said that this increases the volume and thus ups the compression ratio. Now, in the way I said it, Really, that doesn't make that much sense. That is my bad. What I meant is that the volume of the piston head essentially increases, yeah, because you add this flat surface, sort of flat um, cylindrical uh, surface, and then you add a stone, and the volume of the cylinder head increases. That's what I meant, and that's the way you have more compression. Yeah, I could have done a better job of that. Maybe I should have annotated as well, but while I was doing the editing, it didn't really occur to me, and it only occurred to me later on as, as your question came in. Somebody on my uh, Patreon Discord uh, also mentioned the same thing. Uh, a little bit of confusion there. So thanks for that question, and that gave me an opportunity to clarify that here. Rob wants to know, just curious, why isn't the armament fitted? Rob, I actually don't know. So there might be 101 reasons why it wasn't fitted. Maybe the aircraft, when it went to the museum, didn't have the weapons in the first place. After all, apparently it was sold to the Germans prior to the Second World War and then found in a barn somewhere in Germany uh, post-war. It might also be that the weapons were in a bad shape and they're being restored at the moment. It might be There might be insurance reasons, although I don't think so, because the weapons could be relatively easily disarmed or they might be exhibited somewhere else in the museum, although I haven't seen them. Maybe they're on loan somewhere else, who knows? So there you go. There's, there's quite a few reasons that might uh, indicate why the uh, weaponry is not installed, but uh, I just don't know. Trey wants to know, Fokker didn't make many World War II warbirds, did they? No, they didn't. So when Germany invaded the Netherlands in 1940, Fokker essentially went a little bit on a hiatus. Um, he's been back in his home country since the First World War ended. In fact, a lot of the D7s that were uh, still waiting to be finished in the factory lines in Germany, he took a lot of those over to the Netherlands and then essentially combined the pieces there and built new aircraft. During the interwar years, he does have a, quite a few uh, designs coming out, also some commercial aircraft. However, if you're interested, for example, in a specific fighter aircraft that did see use during the Second World War, look at the Fokker uh, D-21. Um, and it's a Roman numeral, so it's XX-1. But I guess if you put into Google D21, that works as well. So uh, that would be one aircraft that uh, might be interesting to look at. Uh, the Finns used it, the Dutch used it, and I think the Danes as well. Irish Bren wants to know, I have a question about quality control. How were design defects and perhaps praise communicated to senior officers and to aircraft manufacturers? Well, back in World War I, this was 
both a informal and a formal affair. Actually, it still is like that in some regards, I guess. But what would happen sometimes is that a certain person who is very influential in an aircraft company, like Fokker himself, would go to the front lines and talk to pilots. And sometimes they would tell him what they like about the aircraft and what they don't like about the aircraft. Fokker himself actually apparently did go to the front lines or near the front lines a couple of times and did meet with some of the uh, more famous pilots. There are a couple of pictures that exist as well with him and some of the famous World War I aces. That's just Fokker being Fokker because he did like to be an esteemed uh, company. But that is one way of giving a little bit of informal feedback. The other way is, of course, you get the aircraft, you let the pilots get used to the aircraft, and then they will write a report on all their observations on the actual aircraft, and then they will then send it back to the factories, and maybe they can make some changes. So um, that system of feedback and taking on board what the pilots say was already around during the First World War. Mr. Upper wants to know, did Fokker design it or Reinhold Platz? Neither, as far as I know. Both had certain influences on the aircraft, but uh, as far as I'm aware, the design bureau at Fokker had uh, essentially drawn up the Fokker D7 and designed it itself. So for the final question, we have C-Pop. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, simply asking which movies. So I presume he wants to know what movies did the Fokker D7 star in after it was handed over to the Allies, because the Americans actually used them in some Hollywood movies. Now, there's a couple, um, Dawn Patrol, Hell's Angels, Hell's Angels probably being the one that most people know. Uh, there's Flight Commander, uh, there's Crimson Romance, and then there's also Aces High and Blue Max. However, I think in Aces High and Blue Max, they were replicas. They were not actual original Fokkers. So there you go. And there, there's a couple of more movies as well, but those are the main ones. I myself actually only knew Dawn Patrol and Hell's Angels, and I thought that Aces High... Sorry, in, not in Angels High, in Aces High, you also had those D7s, but apparently those are replicas. So I hope you guys enjoyed that little Q&A on the Fokker D7. Remember, if you have questions about the respective aircraft that I cover in uh, Inside the Cockpit, please leave those questions in the respective episode. And uh, as always, I hope you guys uh, are safe and sound, keeping, keeping yourself well isolated, uh, keeping yourself healthy during uh, this crisis. And uh, yeah. Stay safe, stay healthy, have a great day, good hunting, and see you in the sky.